Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We close the calendar year reminding ourselves and hearing and receiving the comfort God provides as he inspired David to write in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. In the name of Jesus, our only Savior, dear Christian friends. Normally, a night like New Year's or thanks, Christmas or Thanksgiving, or whenever families get together and celebrate, there's some kind of game that will be played. It's a card game or it's a board game. Hopefully it's not too big a Jenga game where there's pieces everywhere crashing through the table and all that. But there's some game that's going to be played. So, since many families aren't getting together as they usually do, we'll play a game of our own here tonight. A little word association game. What word comes to mind when you look back on 2020? And what words come to mind when you look ahead to 2021? We'll just use words that start with the letter C. Who thinks of calm? <laughs> Who thinks of content? And it doesn't start with C, but it sounds like it. How about quiet? I'm guessing nobody uses those three, three words as a word association for this past year. Usually, probably some different words, chaotic, out of control, crazy. That's probably more like, we want the calm and the quiet and to end the year totally at peace and content. And that's not the way too many people feel. <coughs> Excuse me. You look at this year and there's so much isolation and so much separation from people and things you're used to doing. And maybe some things we kind of grumbled about before, and then when you had to work at home for all those days and had to be school classes all those days, maybe it'd be nice to go back to the building and go back to work once or twice instead of always being there. Kind of want that way it used to be before. And it's not that there was anything wrong with, with feeling good about things that you accomplished. You know, when it snows and you see all that snow that you got to shovel out of the driveway or the sidewalk or whatever, you feel good when it's done. Nothing sinful about that. All the work that you get done, there's a good feeling with that. You have all of this to do and you were able to get it all done. You got the whole yard to mow, you got that whole field to harvest, whatever it is. And you got it done and you feel pretty good. Look what I did. But this year we didn't get to do an awful lot of that, did we? We were forced to be isolated and forced to be away from a lot of people, but was there still that same level of satisfaction? Look what I was able to do. And even if you did accomplish something, did you feel as good about it or did you feel like you skated by by the skin of your teeth and you just barely, barely did it only to have to start it all over again tomorrow? And that's why there really wasn't that peace. There really isn't the satisfaction just in what we do. It doesn't last. It's there for a little while, but it doesn't last. And spiritually, it's really not a thought we can embrace by any means, that I can be isolated, that I can just take care of this on my own. This year, you were forced to do a lot of things that are going to work for you. Helping out at school, having some kids of our own that are still school age. Kind of a contest and a competition every day. How are we going to be able to make this work? And not everybody learned the same way to begin with, and they certainly didn't this year, did they? And the way you're doing your usual job. You had to find a way to make it work for you with what you were able to use. And, and somehow, with all those resources, you had to find a way to get all the work still done. But it was really chaotic. And it really wasn't calm and it wasn't too quiet even if if the outside world was quiet because people were told to be at home tell me your home was really quiet then all year and if the house was actually quiet how quiet was your heart how quiet was your mind 
That thing was a loud gong for 10 straight months, wasn't it? So we look back and look ahead, and we're kind of teetering on this fence. We don't really feel too positive either way, looking back or ahead, until we have this psalm, where Jesus himself tells us, the Lord is my shepherd. In the Good Shepherd chapter in John chapter 10 in the New Testament, he says, I am the Good Shepherd. And he uses the present tense, a continuing thing that isn't going to change. Same thing is said here in Psalm 23. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. We don't have to do this isolated. So, many, so, so often people this year feeling alone and feeling so disconnected from everything. God says, I am your shepherd. That didn't change. And that was the case this past year. It is today, and it will be. That's what present tense continuing means. It's not going to change. After today, people will talk about 2020 as 2020 was. And tomorrow morning, we're going to say 2020 will be. And Jesus says, no. Jesus, that verse says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's is. That's present tense. And that's why Jesus says, the Lord is my shepherd. We so often use this section of God's word at a funeral. But are we really using Psalm 23 just to put our loved one, our friend, our brother or sister in the faith to give them a good burial? Is that what we're doing tonight? We're going to read Psalm 23, so 2020 is just out of here and gone, and we're going to bury it and never speak of it again. That's not the purpose for using the psalm, is it? We use the psalm for ourselves. We want the comfort. We want to be strengthened. When we feel the most helpless, the most hopeless, when we feel like we can't go on and we need to be strengthened, rather than looking back on ourselves and saying, look what I was able to do by my own strength, when we need that, that's when we turn to this psalm. And it's very appropriate to use on New Year's because you look back and, and maybe it didn't go the way you planned. How many of you really had a family get-together, let's just use the most recent ones, Thanksgiving and Christmas, the way you wanted to? We Zoomed with our family. And honestly, listen to my mother-in-law for a half hour saying, can you hear me? Can you see me? No, Margaret, we can't. And, but she couldn't do anything about it because she didn't know how to work the toy she was on because that, too, was brand new. It was supposed to help. Just made her all, I don't want to know what her blood pressure was. Probably wasn't healthy. We didn't get to do that much the way we wanted to. Yet God says, I am, and I will take care of you. I, I will be the one to see this through. As we, we look to when we're the most helpless, that's when the shepherd comes and says, I've got this. And again, that's what we have. Not had before 2020 hit. Not had before everybody had to start wearing masks and distance learning. Got way too familiar with Zoom and all that other stuff. I am your shepherd. That's what God himself tells us. It seems a little bit out of place, though, doesn't it, to have the psalm say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Okay. So in 2020, none of you were found yourself in need or want of TP? It was always there when you wanted it in the store, I mean? Not for everybody. You could always find hand sanitizer and Clorox wipes when you wanted them. Could you find the meat always when you wanted to? Or was that maybe, you know, you get one a day, I kept getting the looks at any store I went to. I said, i got to feed seven people. <laughs> I'm not trying to hoard the food. <laughs> we have a lot of mouths to feed. You go through the same thing. Even for a while there, we were wondering if there was going to be any change. they give you a dollar. Are you going to have any change for me? Lots of things that we wanted in the past year, physically. And then we wanted physical and mental well-being and good health. That wasn't the case for everyone. We wanted success for our kids at school and sports. That didn't happen the way they wanted. We wanted things for the adults to be normal at work and worship. That didn't really happen all that much either. We, how in the world can we say, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Let's take a step back from the second phrase and go to the first. Even more than the stuff that is provided by the shepherd, don't we need the shepherd to do the providing? And that's where the psalm starts. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. A sheep needs that. A sheep is completely dependent on the shepherd to care for them and provide for them. 
The people that I know that work with sheep, if you do not watch them, it's like having a toddler. <laughs> you have to do everything for them or things will not go well for the sheep. You have to be that personally involved and connected. So the, the gifts that are provided are certainly beneficial and useful. But we need the person, the shepherd, to provide. And throughout this year, feeling alone and feeling isolated and feeling separated, God comes and says, you're not. There were times, it's kind of hard to see his face this past year, wasn't it? But was this year brand new to that? Earlier than 2020? Were there times where it was kind of hard to see where God was and what his will was and what he was trying to accomplish by what was going on in our lives and in the world around us? That's been going on ever since the fall into sin. And he comes and says, I am your shepherd. And the shepherd is going to provide for his sheep. And does the sheep really give that a thought at all? I'm not saying we should trivialize God as the shepherd. And I'm not saying that we should make light of him in any way. But the sheep just simply says, that shepherd is going to take care of me. And that's what you and I can say as well. He'll provide what we need because he is that shepherd. So David says, he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. He's providing these, these restful, peaceful situations in a really loud and chaotic world. Probably not too calm and quiet, a lot more chaotic. And yet, think back a week to Christmas, and with as loud as the rest of the world was, you have that quiet message, unto you is born this day a Savior. And you sing some lullabies. We sang some quieter hymns for Christmas. We still did sing Joy to the World, but some of those quieter ones that speak of peace. I'm not really very good at that. I'm kind of like the preschoolers who when we had them sing Away in a Manger, how did they sing? It was about as loud as they could sing it, couldn't they? But that's just coming from here, isn't it? And that's the peace we have that only the shepherd can provide. That's the green pastures. That's the quiet waters. And that's where there is a peace for you and me that only the shepherd can provide. He restores my soul and guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's when we want to be refreshed and need to be restored. You know, it wasn't easy to do that. Day by day when you know you got to work from home and school's at home and all those kinds of things. And it's not the way you're used to doing things and want to do them. It's kind of hard to feel refreshed every morning, wasn't it? Lots of people joking in the past year about what color sweatpants am I going to wear to the office today, you know, out on the couch and things like that. And it's kind of hard to, to really feel motivated and refreshed when you're at work and home all day long and you stare at the ceiling way too long, don't you? And your brain never really calms down. You're in road gear the whole night long and you can't really concentrate. You can't rest. And then we come and the shepherd says, I'll restore your soul. I'll bring a peace and a calm that the world can't. As you and I connect to the shepherd and hear his voice, that's peaceful when the rest is chaotic. Did we get to do that the way we're used to doing it? No. But were we completely separated from hearing the shepherd this year? So lots of different ways we could do it. And some people are pretty accustomed to doing it now and some still struggling to figure out how this is all going to work. But we still have access to the shepherd, don't we? And we still hear his voice that when everything is completely chaotic around us, he says, I'll restore your soul. There will be a time of refreshing. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The verse doesn't mean that we, we take a bunch of unnecessary and unsafe risks. And it doesn't mean that we just try to test God, you know, like the devil telling Jesus just jumped off the, the top of the temple, nothing bad will happen to you, things like that. It doesn't mean the Christian does that. But it means that even though we hear those verses from earlier, speaking about the shortness of this life, the frailty of this life, how temporary this world is, and how the grass withers and the flowers fall, and it's glorious and beautiful for a while, but then it's time has passed. The Christian looks at that still with an optimism, saying... My shepherd died, but he still lives. And that's why he calls himself my present tense good shepherd and still is today. Changing the calendar year won't change that. He still will be. And that's why we face even mortality with a confidence 
and a peace. Because everything that happened to Jesus has been credited to us. And death now truly will be just a sleep. The shepherd says, I'm here with you. Doesn't deny you're in the valley of the shadow of death. But who else do we want to be with but the shepherd who endured it himself and overcame it? That's why the table is prepared in the presence of enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. At the end of the year, individually and as a country, we look back and, and think about and remember all those we've lost. You know, Maybe it's the athlete or the entertainer or you know, whoever in your personal life uh, has been called out of the world. Or, or you just kind of say, well, in January we had this and now we don't. It's easy to look back and think what we lost. God never loses anything, does he? Even the people that have been called out of this world, he calls to himself. He doesn't lose them. He says, I'm going to care for you as a shepherd for a while here, and I will forever in heaven, which gives us a peace. And we recognize our cup truly overflowing. Even the things that we don't have now, that we had a month or a year or several years ago, they're all blessings from God. And how many do we have? A whole lot more than just one Thursday in, in November deserves our thanks, doesn't it? And that's why David says, in spite of all this, look what my shepherd is providing. You think the sheep really pays attention and runs a list, writes a journal every day about all the things the shepherd did for him? But yet, how personally involved was that shepherd? And how blessed did the sheep end up being? And that's you and me. Everything that our Savior provides for us as that present tense shepherd. And even when this life ends, it's not done. Because he says, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Been hearing a lot of people, anytime in the winter, people say, you know, I can't wait for the spring to get out of the house again. You see that with the kids all the time. They, they like playing basketball and having recess in the gym. But it's kind of nice to be outside and feel the sun on your face again and things like that. Lots of people want to get back to normal and all these other things that we've been saying for a lot longer than we want to be saying them. But what's David saying? I'm going to a place I never want to leave. I'm going to a situation that I don't want ever to change. And it's not going to. Because again, that's our God and our shepherd. It doesn't change the way we do. Nothing is going to stop dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. Things absolutely happen that make us change our plans. Nothing happens that keeps the shepherd from caring for his sheep and getting us to the eternal reward. So to go back to the word association game, can we say we're calm and quiet and content? We can. Certainly not on our own, but look at what the shepherd is providing for the sheep. Again, yesterday and today and forever. And in the, in the social media world and a lot of other places, people call Thursday, Thankful Thursday. We certainly have a lot of reason to give thanks. And not just because 2020 is over. I'll be honest, I was typing out the bulletin for tomorrow morning, and I kind of smiled. Not because I was typing so well, because I don't type well at all. But I smiled at the heading, typing January 1st, 2021. I didn't have to type 2020 one more time. We're not just saying good riddance to the year, are we? The calendar is going to fade, but the shepherd who got us through that year is still the one who'll get us through the next and through all eternity. So with all the struggles in life and the things that are chaotic and out of control, and confusing and crazy to you and me, the shepherd says, I am your shepherd. You shall not want. The peace of God which passes our human understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the confession of sins and the prayers that continue our worship order.
Grace and mercy and peace are yours. From God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Study God's Word, the message based on the second lesson for today, New Year's Day, from the beginning, the introduction of Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 1. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only Savior. The second commandment protects God's name. The eighth commandment protects God's gift of our good name. And we talk about how when we, how we act, what we say, it reflects on God with that second commandment. If we're using the name to bless and save, or if we're using it for sinful purposes, that reflects also on our God. And the Eighth Commandment speaks about how important and how valuable your good name and your reputation is, and how what people think of you is going to go a long way to determining, you know, do they trust you? Do they consider you reliable? Are you going to be hired for a job? Uh, friends that you may or may not have because of what they think about you? They just hear a name, and there's automatically a picture that pops into their mind. And we always hope good. Is it always that way? If I just say, not a person's name, but if I just say 2020, how many positive things pop right into your head? Last night we played a bit of a word association game looking back on the year, and what really wasn't the positive things that came to mind. And 10 years, 20 years from now, when people look back on 2020, there's going to be some positive things they think of, but there will probably be more negative ones that come to mind first. And that happens with people, too. Think of the highest elected office in our country. You mention a president's name, whoever the president happens to be. Somebody's going to think something positive of them. And somebody's going to think only negative things about them. And all they hear is the name. And they probably have never even met the person face to face. They don't really know him. They know of the person, but they don't really know them. But automatically something comes to mind, positive or negative, just by hearing the, the politician's name, by hearing the, the athlete's name. Maybe he's a really good person, but he always beats your team so you don't like him. Or the entertainer, you just think they're greedy, selfish, or something. You don't really know them. You listen to them a lot. You see them on TV a lot. You watch all their movies, but do you really know them? But you know the name, and you associate something with them right away. You hear a name and there is an automatic response. So today we have Jesus given his name formally, Jesus. And when you hear the name, what automatically comes to your mind? And like we said last night playing a word association game, we'll do the same thing today. What one word comes to mind with Jesus? There's a whole lot of pictures that come to mind. And he calls himself by many different names. He calls himself Good Shepherd and all kinds of other titles throughout the Bible. But what one word can summarize all of them? It would really be love. And a lot of people miss that. But that's really what the name Savior is going to mean for you and me. It's in love that Jesus did all that work. So when we think one word to associate with Jesus, certainly Savior is going to fit, but why he did that, it's all about love. His unconditional love for you and me. This eighth day after the birth of a Jewish boy, he was officially circumcised, so there was already eight days after his birth a drawing of blood. No bones broken, but there was a drawing of blood just as is going to happen on the day he's crucified. There will be blood then as well. There's blood in the circumcision, right, as he is officially placed under the covenant. He becomes our substitute. He really did put himself under the law. So he's circumcised on the eighth day. He's formally given the name. Think of eight days after John the Baptist was born. There was that big family discussion about what his name is going to be until Zechariah said, his name is John. The same thing happens this eighth day after Jesus is born. He's officially given the name Jesus, the name which was given to Mary and Joseph by the angel when the Savior's birth was announced. And many times God gave people a specific name called them a specific word because of a life experience, something that they endured or something that God accomplished through them. Jesus can really only have one name. When God becomes a human being and he's going to now be given a human name, what other name can he have? He can have the name of his father and he can have some other family name, but that won't really describe the work he was sent to do. The name means savior. And Savior is all about God's love for you and me. 
In the Apostles' Creed, we confess that Jesus on the last day will come back to judge the living and the dead. So you're thinking, Jesus is the judge. You'd be right. But that's still a loving thing God's doing as he takes us to the home he himself won for us. In the last Sunday of the church year, we have Christ the King Sunday. And many of the Christmas hymns that we sing during this time of the year and throughout the year speak of Jesus being King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you're certainly going to be correct calling Jesus a King, but it's also going to be in love that he carries out that, not just about himself, all his functions as a King. He's going to do out of his love for his creation. And that name Savior is also going back to an active love which he is going to put on display for you and me. Paul reminds the Romans of that. He's saying that he's not coming with some new message. This is the message from the prophets of old. This is what God always said. Paul was given apostleship and a designated job and responsibility by God to go and preach, specifically to Gentiles. But if there were Jews there, Paul's going to share the message with them as well. Often going into the Jewish synagogue when he got to a new city, but then also reaching out to be as inclusive as possible because the Savior really is there for everyone. But he says, this isn't my own message. This is the message God promised long ago, that in love, he'd take it on himself to save the entire world. So Jesus, in love, will willingly humble himself we spoke during those Wednesdays in Advent that we speak about on Christmas Day that God himself, the almighty, eternal creator God, takes on human flesh and becomes fully human and takes on humanity because that's what has to be done to save. God isn't going to save the people. God said that human life would be offered. So Jesus, in love, has to set aside for a time, the full use of all the power and the glory that he has, as God, takes on full humanity. Then, resumes that exalted state and all the power and glory which he has, rising from the dead, coming to judge on the last day, sitting at the right hand, those other references we have in the Apostles' Creed. And the Spirit leads us to believe that that is our way of salvation. And that's the message from of old. We want a lot of things from last year, to change this year. How horrible would it be if God had a new way of salvation this year? It'd be good for you and me who are still here. But what about the seven brothers and sisters of our church that we mentioned on Saints Triumphant Sunday and we told the bell for them? They're not with us anymore. If God changes his plan now, how are they going to be saved? They believe the old way. And that's going to be the same for you with everything that can change year by year, day to day, minute to minute sometimes, this won't. There is one name that saves, and that is Jesus, and that is all about God's love. It was here in 2020, and he promises the same thing through 2021. But many people think of the name Jesus and don't associate it with Savior. They, they, think, they don't think of it as love. They think, well, God must be rules and a bunch of commands that I got to follow. Well, this is going to be my year. And I know a lot of people are talking about kind of walking quietly into 2021. <laughs> not anybody claiming this is going to be my year because last year taught us to, to not make plans too far in advance, didn't it? Because they're all going to change. What's this year about? Are there still going to be rules? Yeah, there are. Because those commandments are from God. And as we had in the New Year's Eve lessons, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of God stands forever. So the commands He had for us last year are still the same commands we have this year. But in love, God actually gives us those commands. Imagine being de demanded by God that you obey Him perfectly, but He doesn't tell you what to do. It'd be like having an assignment in class. And you have no idea if you're, are you just supposed to do the odd number, the even numbers, what pages are you on, what lesson am I doing? What am I supposed to do? The teacher just says there's a quiz tomorrow and you better pass. They need to tell you that. And in love, God tells us, this is my list of do's and my list of do nots. And this is going to be my perfect and holy will for all people of all time. And it won't change. And in love, he lets us know that. Some of them... We kind of wonder, did he actually have to give us that command? Did he have to give us a commandment, don't murder and hurt each other? 
Did he have to give us a command, don't take what isn't yours? Related to your gift of a good name, does he have to give us a command, don't tell lies about people because that's going to hurt their reputation? You'd think we wouldn't need them. But in love, God gave them to us. And when people stopped communicating them, he took it on himself to inscribe it in stone so that people are without excuse. He made sure that we knew what his demands were. And then he sent a Savior who, in love, fully obeyed all those commands perfectly every day. We said eight days after he's born, he's circumcised. He becomes a child of the covenant. He's placed under that law, even though as God, Jesus is the giver of the law. But to save you and me in love, he humbles himself to say, I will now follow those commands every day of my life. So you and me, when we look to this year and talk about, as the choir sang, glorify your name. As we're going to sing in the last hymn today, whatever it is that's happening through this year, I'm going to trust that my Father knows what he's doing. He will be with me as he has promised. He will provide and protect as he has promised and always done. And may all I think, say, and do glorify him. That's something that comes from the heart, isn't it? The fourth commandment, God tells us, honor your father and mother. And the explanation does speak about obeying. But what does God... If you have to give one word again, honor or obey. We can do a lot of obeying without a lot of honor, can't we? We can do a lot of obeying without loving the person. Here, fine, this is done. A checklist, I did them all. God wants all those things to be done from the heart. It was in love that Christ humbled himself, perfectly obeyed for us, and it's in love that God wants us to respond, as we have in the end of the first article of the Creed, thank, praise, serve, and obey, but because he has first done all this for me. Our attitude, not just on New Year's Day, not just hoping for the new year to be better than the last year ended up being, not just while the decorations are still up for a few more days. We want every day to be something that says, glorify your name. Your name, which means Savior. And a Savior simply because you love me that much. That's how Paul addresses the Romans. Those dearly loved by God. And there are many times in our lives... Things happen and we wonder where God's love is because it just doesn't seem like love to us. But God has called us his dearly loved children. It wasn't just the Romans, it's you and me too. It says we're, he called us loved by God and it's shown by Jesus who alone can provide grace, which is undeserved love, who alone provides peace, that peace which the world cannot give. Whatever this year happens to bring, we have a loving Savior who says, I will give you what you so desperately need and can't give for yourself. Sometimes you're going to hear a name or hear a year and you're going to cringe and not a lot of good thoughts are going to come to mind. May God grant that every time we hear the name Jesus, we don't just think rules and judge and punishment. May we always think that's the name of love. That's the name, the only name by which we are saved. A name that sh shows us and proves us. God just doesn't say he loves. He proves it to us in action. One of the hymns we have in the hymnal summarizes it with this rhyme. Jesus, name of wondrous love, name all other names above, unto which must every knee bow in deep humility. Jesus, name decreed of old to the maiden mother told, kneeling in her lowly cell by the angel Gabriel. Jesus, name of priceless worth to the fallen here on earth, for the promise that it gave, Jesus shall his people save. Jesus, only name that's given under all the mighty heaven, whereby all to sin enslaved burst their fetters and are saved. Jesus, name of wondrous love, human name, of God above, pleading only this, we too flee, O God, in faith to you. Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his Son, who as to his human nature 
was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of God which passes our human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the confession. To us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God's word recorded by in the first lesson of the weekend from Micah chapter 5. Maybe see this. <clears throat> Name of Jesus Christ, our only Savior. Sometimes from week to week in church, it's, it's hard to continue the train of thought from the previous week. Might be in the summertime when you, don't, you might not have a consecutive series of readings. You know, one week, say in the second lesson, you're reading a few verses from Romans, and then the next week, the next verses, and then so on. And you have that consecutive thing. You, it's a little bit easier to follow the train of thought. But what if you miss one of the weekends, or you can't hear it for whatever the reason? Well, it's kind of like watching a bunch of shows and then you've watched episodes one, two, and three, and you're just going to pick up in number five or six and know what happened there in the middle, it's a little bit hard to know unless you've followed the whole sequence. So that, that can be difficult in the summer. Could even be difficult with all the extra services that we've had in the last six weeks, Advent and Christmas and, and New Year's. Lots of service opportunities, but sometimes there were so many chances. What actually did we talk about each time? And what was the progression from week to week, and how do we get here today, closing the Christmas season, Wednesday's January 6th, so we have Epiphany starting then, to wrap it all up, you know, where did we start, how did we get here? Well, during Advent on the weekends, we had that general theme of Christ is coming. Since he's coming, watch for it and be alert, prepare for it, rejoice that it's coming, and recognize that the Christ who's coming is the royal heir of David, that promised descendant Again, as Micah even speaks about today. The extra services we added during the week, on, during Advent, focused on the two natures of Christ, spoken of really in that second lesson for today, and how it had to be Jesus fully God and fully human in order to save. Only through his humiliation, setting aside the full use of his power and glory for a time, and his exaltation, taking it up again, only then do we have the forgiveness we need in order to be qualified as a believer into eternal life. Then on Christmas, you have specifically that virgin birth of Christ, that there's no biological father conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He sang it in the first hymn again today, the word who became flesh and lived among us, God himself. But as we just sang in the second hymn, come from on high to me, because I can't go on my own to you. It doesn't work that way. God actually has to humble himself and come to us. Not too many other kings in the history of the world did that. The people, the subjects, had to go find the king and hope they would be granted presents and all those other things that went along with the, the formalities of the king. The king of kings actually comes to us. And as we last weekend, we saw how those gifts the king brings, hope and joy and peace and love, they're for all people, not just one or two. You know, we're used to having one particular name under a present under the tree, or maybe mom and dad have a gift for all the kids. Growing up, we always had that one that was for everybody. And of course, since my brother was the youngest one, he always got to open it, which us perfect middle children think is amazingly fair. The younger kids always got to open up extra presents. But, but all the names were on them. Jesus literally comes as the gift at Christmas to the world. 
Not just my kids, everyone. And those are the gifts, hope, joy, peace, and love that don't last. That was the progression throughout Advent, throughout Christmas. So on New Year's, we could close the year confident and at peace and content because the Savior, with everything that changed or may change this year, he's still a changeless shepherd. And we began the year, New Year's Day, Jesus, whose name means Savior, and that Savior all about God's love. So that's really the progression of how we get here. So today, being the last Sunday of the Christmas season, Wednesday beginning Advent, what's the response to all of that? What's the response to prepare and rejoice and watch and be alert? And here comes God and man in the flesh to save you and me all because of his love. What's the response? What happened in the gospel reading? Well, some people listened and some didn't. How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Doesn't scripture say the Messiah will come from David's descendants? From Bethlehem, the town where David lived? And the people were divided because of Jesus. Well, Micah tells us, and really all of scripture tells us, the Christ child who was born, that doesn't stop just because Christmas, <coughs> the season is over, doesn't stop just because the decorations get put away. The Christ child reigns as the eternal shepherd king. And many did and still do reject that, but that shepherd king is the only one, that Christ child is the only one who brings a real peace to this world. And that's what Micah tells us. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears the son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. And they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. It's a comforting message, isn't it? But you notice the heading says Micah 5, verse 2. What did Micah say, Micah 5, verse 1? He said, marshal your troops, Jerusalem. Bad stuff is coming. Babylonians are coming, and there's going to be a great destruction, and not just a peaceful, okay, everybody follow in, fall in line, stay your six feet apart, of course, and move ahead as the line in front of you goes. No, when the Babylonians came, it was going to be very destructive, it was going to be very gruesome, and it was going to be, unfortunately, another in the long line of gruesome destruction that the Israelites knew because at one time it was going to be the Philistines or it was going to be the Midianites or it was going to be one of the other Canaanite peoples there that God allowed to come as a discipline to his people he said your rejection of me is only going to last for so long before I will kind of force you to start paying attention to me again you are prosperous and successful and at peace when you're following me and when you're following your own wishes or the ways of the world Nothing good spiritually comes, and you are farther and farther away from me. So the Israelites knew about destruction and how brutal that was going to be and gruesome even in Old Testament times. They didn't have the weapons you and I had today. That doesn't mean it was any less bloody and any less destructive, and the Babylonians were going to carry the Israelites off. That's verse 1. And yet what does Micah say in the exact following verse? But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Micah says, destruction is coming. And we today, going back a couple of weeks before Advent and the season of end times, we're living in the end times. Last judgment, saints triumphant, Christ the King, be ready and watch, be prepared for that last day as well. That judgment and destruction is coming. But just as Micah prophesied peace, we carry the same peace in, in the end time days because of who is coming. It's not us. <clears throat> it's not even Jerusalem. In verse 1, Jerusalem, get ready. You're the capital city. You're going to be attacked. You're going to be destroyed. But out of Bethlehem, Little tiny Bethlehem, maybe not even a thousand people in this village, probably not even a town, more of a village as we would call things. 
out of little Bethlehem down in Judah. Yes, David's city, but small in the eyes of man. <clears throat> out of you will come one who will be ruler over Israel. The Babylonians are going to win a victory for a time, but it's not going to last. You and I are facing our spiritual enemies day by day, but they don't win an eternal victory either, do they? There's a victor, and there is a peace, and it's the one who is born in Bethlehem, the one who comes from David's line. And that's why at the gospel reading, those people were correct. Isn't the Messiah supposed to come from Bethlehem? But just the way it's, it's written here doesn't necessarily mean the child had to be born, lived, and died all in Bethlehem. just means you were going to be born there. That's what happened. Caesar Augustus issued a decree that its census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee and Ju to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, with Mary pledged to be married to him. Both from the line of David, Jesus born there in royal David's town, little Bethlehem, and the prophecy is fulfilled. Didn't have to come from the great and mighty city of Jerusalem. Didn't have to come from the king's palace. God was going to bring about his victor in his own way and in his own time. And that's what Jesus accomplishes. So the Savior does come, the victor does come from Bethlehem, as, as Micah also says, as, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. <clears throat> there wasn't anything in history that was going to stop God from accomplishing his work of saving you and me. History sure tried. All kinds of people trying to squash the Israelites in the Old Testament and squash not just them as a people, but that message that they proclaimed. People trying to squash the early New Testament church. People trying to squash the message 500 years during the Reformation. People still trying to squash that Christian message today. Pretty much a, listening to any other message, approving of every other one's message, except when the Christian says, this is what the Lord says. But all those attempts, Old Testament, New Testament, Middle Ages, today, they didn't stop God from doing his work. Popular Christmas TV show, The Grinch is going to do anything to keep Christmas from coming. And of course, since it's a happy show, at the end, he can't stop Christmas from coming. Nothing people were going to ever try would keep God from sending his son. He promised the Savior would be born in David's town. And that's exactly what happened. <clears throat> and that shepherd, that Christ child is the shepherd king who is the ruler over all Israel. And nothing would stop that. And that Christ child will be king. That's what Micah calls him. Who, who's, uh, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. Well, what's a king? A king has to be eternal. The Babylonian king that comes in, he rules for a time, and then he's done. Just like every other human earthly ruler. Just like every other human and earthly empire. It had its time, and then it concluded. And God is eternal. Here comes the Christ child, God himself, who is eternal. So he is the eternal victor, the eternal ruler. <clears throat> he's the one in control of all things. We look at it today, and the critic of the Bible looks at it today, saying... This little baby is in control of all things? Then why does God have to tell the wise men to tell Mary and Joseph the child is going to be killed by Herod? You go away, and we're not going back to Herod. Why does the angel have to come and tell Joseph, get the child and his mother and go to Egypt? Why doesn't Jesus just tell him? Because he's also fully human. And he humbles himself of the full use of all his power as God, <coughs> And he'll be himself carried off to Egypt rather than leading his parents by the hand. He's carried to Egypt. And yet as God, still in control of all things, because nothing Herod tried was going to stop that. Nothing the Babylonians were going to do was going to stop that. God is going to provide the victor and champion, the peace that the world can't provide. And the Savior is going to defeat all his enemies. That ruler, that, that's when you be, get to become king, right? You've put everything under your feet. And Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. He must reign till he's put everything under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
We have the Christ child born and we're singing, O come let us adore him. And now sing we now rejoice in joy to the world in silent night. And all of our other favorite Christmas songs. And we're full of peace and hope and joy. And yet it can't stop there with the baby Jesus being rocked to sleep away in a manger. We have to have the horrible scene of Good Friday. Because only then does this ruler defeat all his enemies, which he's taken as his own because he's our substitute. He must defeat sin, he must defeat death, he must defeat the devil. Not just some earthly empire and some earthly ruler. He's got to defeat those. Defeating the earthly empire and ruler is going to make our earthly life more comfortable. Defeating the viruses and all the other attacks we face in our personal and church lives today will make our earthly lives more comfortable and peaceful. But what really brings peace? Sin has been destroyed. Death has been destroyed. The power of devil of the devil has been destroyed. And that's what is prophesied here. He will be their peace. And he will shepherd his flock. So the Christ child reigns as this king... <coughs> And he's the ruler above all rulers. But as king, he's also the shepherd, which isn't what we usually associate with king. Usually we think, again, you know, king far away in his palace, keeping all his subjects under his thumb. The shepherd part of the king reminds us he's personally involved. He knows his sheep. He is that concerned about them. He is that present with them. After all, that's what Emmanuel means, God with us. So there is a personal connection the shepherd king has with his people. There's a care, <clears throat> there's a love that the shepherd king provides, which explains everything that he does. He's not ruling for his own power, and so that he gets to wear the crown and sit on the big throne. He's doing all of that so that you and I will receive those blessings that come from the shepherd king's sacrifice. What king is going to sacrifice himself for his subjects? He's going to send them out to fight. The king is going to be loved and worshipped and honored and adored who actually went out and led the people into the battle, isn't he? Our king takes the whole battle on himself. He doesn't say, follow me. He says, I love you and care for you enough as your king, but as your shepherd, I'm going to win the battle myself through my sacrifice. <laughs> So the Christ child does reign as eternal shepherd king. And we're familiar with a, with a term like new leadership taking over. And in January, after a November election, we're used to inaugurations taking place in January. But whoever it is in this world, whatever the earthly position they have, they will not and they cannot reign as Jesus does. They can't be the eternal king. And they can't be the shepherd king the way Jesus is. Many did reject it in Jesus' day, and many continue to reject it today. But long after the decorations have been taken down, long after the last Christmas carol is sung, <coughs> when we're, quote, back to normal, <laughs> wherever that is and whatever that is, there is still a peace, and there's still a joy, and there's still this reign from the Christ child who did everything, not just being born, but everything to bring about that peace. Even though it started as a child, what was Simeon's reaction last Sunday? He sees a baby, holds the baby in his arms, and says, Lord, dismiss your servant in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you haven't only prepared for me, you've prepared for the world. Christmas joy and Christmas peace through the reign of the Christ child as shepherd king endures. May we always celebrate that, treasure it, share it by all possible means and with every opportunity that God gives us. Because there alone is a lasting real peace, which passes our human understanding, but guards our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the confession of sins and the prayer.